Welcome to Glendale First United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Angela, and I'm glad that you are joining us today in ordinary time. This is the sign of the green. It just means that it's the season before Lent, which Lent is around the corner just a month away, or maybe even less than a month at this point. So I'm glad you're joining in. I hope that this time will be a time where you connect with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your life, that you can be filled up with joy and hope and strength. Um, that's why we listen, we engage, we pray, we read the scriptures. Amen. There are a couple announcements for us today. Uh, we are so incredibly joyful that we have been able to hire a new children and family coordinator. Her name is Joyce Wade. She will be with us on Sunday. Uh, this church is, uh, we're really highlighting ministry to children and their families. We wanna make sure that our children know that they're loved by God, that God is with them. And we're gonna do it in a fun and exciting way. I don't want church to ever be boring. And so um, if you're able to come and bring your children, if you know somebody who's local, who would like to come, uh, we're gonna really focus on children and families moving forward. Thank you also for those who are donating to the church, uh, that you are committed to uh, being present. Presence is not just being here, it's also tuning in online. Presence, prayers, gifts, service, and witness. So thank you for your commitment as we remind people that as Methodists, we do this every week, a reminder of who we are and the kind of people that we wanna be. If you would like to, to give to the church or continue to giving to the church, you can do so at glendalefirst.org. God bless you for all the ways that you already give. Thank you. Today's scripture reading is Gospel of Mark, chapter one, verses 21 to 28. They went to Carbalon, and when a Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be quiet and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And then they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Welcome to part three of Becoming the People of God, and today's sermon is called Rebuking the Devil. I will pray us into this time. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord God, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Spirit, thank you that you are present with us, with me and the folks that are watching and listening, that you are the God who invites us to listen to your word, to open our hearts to you, to receive you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A couple years back, uh, somebody from the church came up to me and said, Pastor, we did something. We were playing with these dark arts and uh, we think we conjured up this demon. We're terrified. Please come to our home and help us. Bless the house, do something. And so, as a pastor who loves, I love my parishioners, I love the people, and anybody who's asking for help, I would go and be a presence of help in whatever ways I can, I went. Now, some of you might be, who are watching might say, well, pastor, you can't possibly believe in Satan or the devil. I mean, that possibly can't be real. This is what I would say to you. Uh, I would say that I've seen a lot of dark things in this world that I cannot explain. I've seen evil things that are terrifying and uh, just 
evil to the core. And uh, so there's a lot of things that I cannot explain. And I also know that there are a lot of spiritual things. The spiritual things uh, are mostly mysterious, that we don't have answers to many of the things. It's, uh, it, there's a lot of faith and a lot of uh, engagement, spiritual, emotional engagement that we do. We step out in faith, we open our hearts and then we get a, a feeling, but we don't know exactly how it works. There's a lot of mystery to this. And so in that fashion, I don't know if the devil exists or doesn't exist. And I don't even think that's a fair question. I think there are oppressive systems and oppressive thoughts that come and terrorize a human being. And anytime somebody is afraid or somebody is oppressed or somebody is trampled, well, that's the devil. It's coming against you. It is there to steal, kill, or destroy you. That's the epitome. That is the definition of what the devil does or who he is in scripture. So I went to the person's house and I could see the fear in their faces. I could see that they were terrified. And so, I, you know, when I went, I looked around, I didn't see anything that was odd. I, I didn't see ghosts or I didn't see anything demonic in that house. It was just a beautiful home. Uh, but then I told them that I would go from room to room and I would bless them and I would invoke the power of Christ. Uh, invoke is this idea of calling on who Christ is to be center in that room, in that space. So for instance, I went to the kitchen and I, and I said, may this space be a place where you receive nour nourishment and that you have beautiful meals uh, as a family gathering together. I, I went to the bedroom and I said, may this place be a place of rest, that you have uh, dreams that are inspiring and restful and peaceful and that you sleep well at night. I went to the living room and I said, may this place be a place of community, of good conversation and fellowship. I went to the bathroom, the restroom, and I pray that that would be a place of refreshing, that there would be, uh, people would be cleansed from all the things that they carry in that place, both physically and emotionally and spiritually. And I know by the end of that blessing, something had shifted in that house. That family went from being terrified to feeling peace, they felt blessed, they felt hopeful. And in so many ways then, I was able to rebuke that devil, that devil of fear out of their homes by invoking and inviting the essence of the Holy Spirit. You see, Christ helps us, empowers us to dismantle these kind of oppressive powers. And these oppressive powers can be anything. It could be systems uh, in our society, but it could be things that are happening internally. When we invite Christ, we are given this hope, this promise, the God who is good will heal us, will save us, will stand with us, will empower us to be able to stand against these powers and in so many ways, we can say we are rebuking, we are casting out those powers from our lives. And that's the good news of Christ this morning. The good news that Christ gives us that empowerment and that we, as a community of faith, who represent Christ, we do that for one another. All right, let's jump into our scripture. Mark 1 one, uh, 21 through 28. I invite you at home to pick up a Bible if you have it and turn to Mark. Uh, we've been in Mark now for a couple of weeks and uh, in the lectionary, the lectionary is the readings that happen worldwide in the Methodist Church and in the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church. Um, we as Methodists have the option of following the lectionary. Sometimes clergy too, sometimes I don't, sometimes I do, sometimes uh, I, I, I'm, I go where the Spirit leads. And today we are in this lectionary reading, Mark 1, verse 21. Now, last week we talked about how Jesus called the disciples. The word disciple means student. So he called students so that he could teach them. And this is where our story continues. Uh, there were four of them, if you recall. Verse 21, they went to Capernaum 
And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. So Capernaum is a, a, a city, a town, really, and not a city, a town near Nazareth uh, on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. So it's the northern part of ancient Israel. And Jesus went into a synagogue, which was a, a place where people gathered. It, it, synagogue actually means a gathering place for spiritual practice. So they would do readings there and other spiritual practices. And he is, he is teaching there. So there's a sense that he has this authority to teach. Verse 22, they were astounded at his teachings for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now this is really interesting, a really interesting comment because the scribes here had a couple of things that they did. They were the ones that interpreted both the religious law and the civic law, which was intertwined in ancient Israel at that time in the first century. And they interpreted it, they taught it, and also they were responsible for any judicial decisions uh, made on behalf of the law. They were people that were concerned with following these rules more, I may say, and Jesus would comment as well on this, more than they were concerned about the people. They were concerned about the rules more than the people. And Jesus here is teaching as if he is a scribe and an ordained rabbi of sorts, and, but he has authority. In other words, the, this message is saying that Jesus wasn't only interested in the teachings themselves or the rules themselves, he was interested in the people and how those rules helped people live and how it affected people in their community. Verse 23, this is where it gets really interesting. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Now, what do we do with this? You know, our modern lens here, uh, we're, we're trying, we don't understand what this means, an unclean spirit. A little bit of a context here might help. So in the Jewish laws back in that day, back at that time, you were unclean for many different reasons. For instance, a woman going through her monthly process, she was unclean. If you had somebody who died and you were around th that th death or grief, you were considered unclean, ritualistically unclean. If you had a rash, if you had a cold, if you had something slight, you were considered unclean. If you didn't obey the rules just so, you were considered unclean. People spend most of their lives more unclean than clean. <laughs> so this language here, it's specific. It's identifying that this person had some kind of ailment, had some kind of problem, that they were tormented by something. So they had this Thing that was happening to them and they were very they were ill from it and the society and the community around them understood it as such now we can say that this could have been mental illness it's very well it could have very well been mental illness because this uh, awareness of mental illness wasn't quite heightened in the first century okay so we have this man and he enters into the synagogue so there is a sense that this man is looking for help He's looking for spiritual practice. He's looking for salvation. That's why I would assume he entered into the synagogue. Verse 24, and he cried out, he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? He identifies who Jesus is. He knows Jesus's reputation. And he continues on to say, have you come to destroy us? It's interesting that he's referring to himself in the plural here. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So what I, he I see here through my lens is I see fear. I see a lot of fear that this man is tormented by fear. And this is how Jesus responds to that. Verse 25, but Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent. The first part is he stopped the dialogue there because, and a lot of scholars believe this, because it was 
destructive and that whatever was happening in that man was so oppressive that Jesus uh, stopped it uh, in its tracks. He told it to be silent. And then the second part of this is, and be silent and come out of him. He wanted to save him fully from this oppressive power so that he would be fully delivered. Verse 26, and the unclean spirit convulsing him. So he put up a fight. This thing that was happening inside of him would not just let this man go. It had authority. It had claim to the person convulsing him and crying with a loud voice. But eventually here it says, came out of him that the authority that Jesus had in that space of really addressing the issue and pulling it out of him saved him and that it, it was released in his life. Verse 27, they were all amazed. Can you imagine being in that space, seeing this man freed from this oppressive thing that they were experiencing? And they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching? with authority? Like this is not just a rabbi who's teaching us things and doesn't really care about the people. He's teaching us about God's love and then he's advocating on our behalf. He's actually helping us, practically saving us, treating us almost like a medical doctor. What is happening here? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. That Jesus had come not just to teach God's word, but to offer practical, holistic salvation to them, to their hearts, to their bodies, to their minds. That Jesus loved them, that God in Jesus loved them. Many of our ailments in this world, like prejudice, discrimination, racism, all the isms, sexism, homophobia, all of those are connected to fear. Fear drives this. It is the kind of fear that kind of gets in you, gets under your skin, begins to define you. It almost possesses you sometimes. And that fear, if it sits for a long time, it becomes a phobia. And a phobia, which in Greek just means fear, but it is a fear that is experiencing, it becomes a bit of a disorder. It's the kind of fear that's uncontrollable, irrational, and it lasts, it sticks with you. And uh, the research shows that there's about 19 million America, Americans who are struggling with phobias now, who are possessed, if I may say, with this kind of fear. If you do the math, we're talking about 5.5% of the population. That means one in 18 people is struggling with this kind of fear that's almost a disorder. What do we do with this? How do we manage this? Because when that fear grows, when that phobia grows, it is disruptive. It could be a phobia of heights or community, or it could be one of airplanes or dogs or trapped spaces. I mean, it just kind of, it, it accelerates and it grows and it becomes bigger and bigger. And it can even turn into a panic attack, which then you have no control over what your body does. You're just paralyzed with this fear and your body is shutting down. So how do we manage this? Cognitive behavioral therapy is how we manage it. So before the fear happens, before this trigger happens where we're feeling somatically, uh, we feel it in our body, there is a thought that crosses our mind. It can happen in a split second. It could be a thought that grows in us. It's an idea. The idea comes before the fear or the disorder, before the panic. Cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy says you have to catch the idea and you have to silence it. You can't reason with it. There's no reasoning with it. You have to redirect the thought before it takes root in your life. 
That's why a lot of therapists talk about grounding yourself when you're in anxiety, when you're having anxiety or you're having a panic uh, situation. You want to ground yourself, get yourself out of your head, silence the idea that's causing this experience by doing breathing or by doing other practices like uh, naming things in the room and colors and redirecting your brain. It's interesting to me that the silencing of this piece is similar to what Jesus said to this man who had unclean, this unclean spirit. He silenced it. He silenced the toxicity, the toxic idea that led to this, uh, that was connected to this possession. And when we redirect when we redirect these ideas, these thoughts, if you catch them, then you begin getting better. You have more peace. It almost feels like you're released. Something is released in you so that you're not possessed by this fear. As people of faith uh, who also believe in science, I, know I would never say, uh, let us not believe in science. I think those things go hand in hand. The science is an observation of what God has done and we get to observe it through the scientific method. We believe that using these techniques, both through psychology and spiritual practice, is the way to move forward when somebody is oppressed by a system uh, that's paralyzing to them or overwhelming to them. And we know that there are systems, oppressive systems in our world bigger than what's happening inside of us that we also have to silence and redirect so that we can invoke the power of Christ's healing in our society. When hateful speech is spoken out loud, what are we to do? We need to call out and silence it. That there is no space for hate to harm someone else. That's the line. And Jesus made it very, very clear to us. I want to close with the song. During the summer, when I was in Greece and I was going through my renewal, I just presented a, a workshop for our, uh, today about this renewal leave. And I was reminded that during the summer, I listened to this song over and over again by Florence and the Machine, um, created in 12, uh, 2012, I think that came out. And it's really interesting here because she is talking about these uh, demons that come and harass us and that we have the authority and the empowerment to shake them off of us. I'm going to read you the words to this, to this song. Regrets collect like old friends, here to relive your darkness moments. I can see no way, I can see no way, and all the ghouls come out to play. And every demon wants his pound of flesh, but I like to keep some things to myself. I like to keep my issues drawn. It's always darkest before the dawn. And I've been a fool and I've been blind. I can never leave the past behind. I can see no way, I can see no way. I'm always dragging that horse around. All of his questions, such a mournful sound. Tonight I'm gonna bury that horse in the ground because I like to keep my issues drawn. And this is where it, it, it is a real climax to the song but it's always darkest before the dawn. Shake it out, shake it out. And it's hard to dance with a devil on your back. So, so shake him off. That is the message for us today, that we are empowered through Christ to address our fears, to address the things that oppress us, systems that oppress us, that we are to invoke the power of Christ to dismantle those systems in the spaces that are very dark and very evil and so that we can find healing and hope. And when we see our community around us being oppressed, when we see our friends being oppressed, that we are to stand with them, that we are to remind them that they're not alone in this journey, especially if there are so many people struggling with mental health now, that we have to ask these questions about how people are doing and how they're dealing with their lives, and especially if they are experiencing fear, that they are not alone in this real struggle that we experience, that Christ, 
the power of Christ. We invoke the power of Christ and the authority of Christ with us. Let us pray. Holy One, we are grateful that you invite us to rebuke these demons, whatever they look like in our lives, whatever that's dark, whatever that's oppressive, overwhelming, pulls us away from what is good and what is right, we silence them, we redirect our minds, we refocus our minds on you, and we allow our minds to be enveloped by your grace, by your love, a reminder as we, as we pray, as we read the scriptures, we, we fill our minds with what is good and what is hopeful and what is healing, that you are calling us to love God and love neighbor, to love neighbor as you love us, as we love ourselves. Thank you that your grace is with us, that your power is with us, that your might is with us to overcome these dark things in our lives. In Jesus we pray, amen. Let us now receive the blessing, uh, the benediction. May you come to know the empowerment of Christ in your life that if there are systems that are oppressing you, if there's fear, if there are other mental health concerns, may, you're, may you trust in Christ, may you invoke Christ, may you stand on God's promises today. May we be a people of peace, all of us, and take this peace into the world and speak peace to everyone we encounter with the authority of Christ to speak that peace over them. Amen. <laughs>